Chapter Nineteen of the Sorrows of Satan by Marie Corelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The blood rushed to my face, and I stopped abruptly. Let us go back, I said. Why? Because I do not know Miss Clare and do not want to know her. Literary women are my abhorrence, they are always more or less unsexed. You are thinking of the new women, I suppose but you flatter them, they never had any sex to lose. The self-degrading creatures who delineate their fictional heroines as wallowing in unchastity and who write freely on subjects which men would hesitate to name are unnatural hybrids of no sex. Mavis Clare is not one of them. She is an old-fashioned young woman. Mademoiselle de Reno, the dancer, is unsexed, but you did not object to her on that score. On the contrary, I believe you have shown your appreciation of her talents by spending a considerable amount of cash upon her. That's not a fair comparison, I answered hotly. Mademoiselle de Reno amused me for a time. And was not your rival in art, said Lucio, with a little malicious smile. I see, still, as far as the question of being unsexed goes, I, personally, consider that a woman who shows the power of her intellect is more to be respected than the woman who shows the power of her legs. But men always prefer the legs, just as they prefer the devil to the deity. All the same, I think, as we have time to spare, we may as well see this genius. Genius? I echoed contemptuously. Feminine twaddler, then, he suggested, laughing. Let us see this feminine twaddler. She will no doubt prove as amusing as Mademoiselle de Reno in her way. I shall ring the bell and ask if she is at home. He advanced toward the creeper-covered porch, but I stood back, mortified and sullen, determined not to accompany him inside the house if he were admitted. Suddenly a blithe peal of musical laughter sounded through the air, and a clear voice exclaimed, Oh, Trixie, you wicked boy! Take it back directly and apologize! Lucio peered through the fence and then beckoned to me energetically. There she is, he whispered. There is the dyspeptic, sour, savage old blue stocking. There, on the lawn. By heaven, she's enough to strike terror into the heart of any man and millionaire. I looked where he pointed and saw nothing but a fair-haired woman in a white gown, sitting in a low basket chair, with a tiny toy terrier on her lap. The terrier was jealously guarding a large, square dog-biscuit nearly as big as himself, and at a little distance off sat a magnificent rough-coated St. Bernard, wagging his feathery tail to and fro, with every sign of good humor and enjoyment. The position was evident at a glance. The small dog had taken his huge companion's biscuit from him and had conveyed it to his mistress, a canine joke which seemed to be appreciated and understood by all the parties concerned. But as I watched the little group, I did not believe that she whom I saw was Mavis Clare. That small head was surely never made for the wearing of deathless laurels, but rather for a garland of roses, sweet and perishable, twined by a lover's hand. No such slight feminine creature as the one I now looked upon could ever be capable of the intellectual grasp and power of differences, the book I secretly admired and wondered at but which I had anonymously striven to quash in its successful career. The writer of such a work, I imagined, must needs be of a more or less strong physique, with pronounced features, and an impressive personality. This butterfly thing, playing with her dog, was no type of a blue stocking, and I said as much to Lucio. That cannot be Miss Clare, I said. More likely a visitor, or perhaps the companion secretary. The novelist must be very different in appearance to that frivolous young person in white, whose dress is distinctly Parisian, and who seems to have nothing whatever to do but amuse herself. Trixie, said the clear voice again, take back the biscuit and apologize. The tiny terrier looked round with an innocently abstracted air, as if in the earnestness of his own thoughts he had not quite caught the meaning of the sentence. Trixie, and the voice became more imperative. Take it back and apologize. With a comical expression of resignation to circumstances, Trixie seized the large biscuit and holding it in his teeth with gingerly care, jumped from his mistress's knee and trotting briskly up to the St. Bernard, who was still wagging his tail and smiling as visibly as dogs often can smile, 
restored his stolen goods with three short yapping barks, as much as to say, There, take it. The St. Bernard rose in all his majestic bulk and sniffed at it, then sniffed his small friend, apparently in dignified doubt as to which was terrier and which was biscuit. Then, lying down again, he gave himself up to the pleasure of munching his meal. The while, Trixie, with wild barks of delight, performed a sort of mad war dance round and round him by way of entertainment. This piece of dog comedy was still going on, when Lucio turned away from his point of observation at the fence, and going up to the gate, rang the bell. A neat maid-servant answered the summons. "'Is Miss Clare at home?' he asked. "'Yes, sir, but I am not sure whether she will receive you.' the maid replied, unless you have an appointment. We have no appointment, said Lucio, but if you will take these cards. Here he turned to me. Geoffrey, give me one of yours. I complied somewhat reluctantly. If you will take these cards, he resumed, to Miss Clare, it is just possible she may be kind enough to see us. If not, it will be our loss. He spoke so gently and with such an ingratiating manner that I could see the servant was at once prepossessed in his favor. "'Step in, sir, if you please,' she said, smiling and opening the gate. He obeyed with alacrity, and I, who a moment ago had resolved not to enter the place, found myself passively following him under an archway of sprouting young leaves and early budding jessamine into Lily Cottage, which was to prove one day, though I knew it not then, the only haven of peace and security I should ever crave for, and craving be unable to win.' The house was much larger than it looked from the outside. The entrance hall was square and lofty, and panelled with fine old carved oak, and the drawing-room into which we were shown was one of the most picturesque and beautiful apartments I had ever seen. There were flowers everywhere, books, rare bits of china, elegant trifles that only a woman of perfect taste would have the sense to select and appreciate. On one or two of the side tables and on the grand piano were autograph portraits of many of the greatest celebrities in Europe. Lucio strolled about the room, making soft comments. "'Here is the autocrat of all the Russias,' he said, pausing before a fine portrait of the Tsar. "'Signed by the imperial hand, too. Now what has the feminine twaddler done to deserve that honor, I wonder? Here, in strange contrast, is the wild-haired Paderewski, and beside him the perennial Patty. There is Her Majesty of Italy, and here we have the Prince of Wales, all autographed likenesses. Upon my word, Miss Clare seems to attract a great many notabilities around her without the aid of hard cash. I wonder how she does it, Geoffrey. And his eyes sparkled half maliciously. Can it be a case of genius, after all? Look at those lilies. And he pointed to a mass of white bloom in one of the windows. Are they not far more beautiful creatures than men and women? dumb yet eloquent of purity no wonder the painters chose them as the only flowers suitable for the adornment of angels as he spoke the door opened and the woman we had seen on the lawn entered carrying her toy terrier on one arm was she mavis clare or someone sent to say that the novelist could not receive us i wondered silently looking at her in surprise and something of confusion Lucio advanced with an odd mingling of humility and appeal in his manner, which was new to me. "'We must apologize for our intrusion, Miss Clare,' he said. "'But happening to pass your house, we could not resist making an attempt to see you. My name is Rimenez. He hesitated oddly for a second, then went on. "'And this is my friend, Mr. Geoffrey Tempest, the author.' The young lady raised her eyes to mine with a little smile and courteous bend of her head. He has, as I dare say you know, become the owner of Willowsmere Court. You will be neighbors, and I hope friends. In any case, if we have committed a breach of etiquette in venturing to call upon you without previous introduction, you must try and forgive us. It is difficult, to me impossible, to pass the dwelling of a celebrity without offering homage to the presiding genius within. Mavis Clare, for it was Mavis Clare, seemed not to have heard the intended compliment. "'You are very welcome,' she said simply, advancing with a pretty grace, and extending her hand to each of us in turn. "'I am quite accustomed to visits from strangers, but I already know Mr. Tempest very well by reputation. Won't you sit down?' She motioned us to chairs in the lily-decked window corner, and rang the bell. 
her maid appeared. Tea, Janet! This order given, she seated herself near us, still holding her little dog curled up against her like a small ball of silk. I tried to converse, but could find nothing suitable to say. The sight of her filled me with too great a sense of self-reproach and shame. She was such a quiet, graceful creature, so slight and dainty, so perfectly unaffected and simple in manner, that as I thought of the slaughtering article I had written against her work, I felt like a low brute who had been stoning a child. And yet, after all, it was her genius I hated. The force and passion of that mystic quality which, wherever it appears, compels the world's attention. This was the gift she had that I lacked and coveted. Moved by the most conflicting sensations, I gazed abstractedly out on the shady old garden. I heard Lucio conversing on trifling matters of society and literature generally, and every now and then her bright laugh rang out like a little peal of bells. Soon I felt rather than saw that she was looking steadily at me, and turning, I met her eyes, deep, dense blue eyes, candidly grave and clear. "'Is this your first visit to Willowsmere Court?' she asked. "'Yes,' I answered, making an effort to appear more at my ease. I bought the place on the recommendation of my friend, the prince here, without looking at it. "'So I heard,' she said, still observing me curiously. "'And you are satisfied with it?' "'More than satisfied. I am delighted. It exceeds all my best expectations.' "'Mr. Tempest is going to marry the daughter of the former owner of Willowsmere,' put in Lucio. "'No doubt you have seen it announced in the papers.' "'Yes,' she responded, with a slight smile. "'I have seen it, and I think Mr. Tempest is much to be congratulated. Lady Sybil is very lovely. I remember her as a beautiful child when I was a child myself. I never spoke to her, but I often saw her.' She must be charmed at the prospect of returning as a bride to the old home she loved so well. Here the servant entered with the tea, and Miss Clare, putting down her tiny dog, went to the table to dispense it. I watched her move across the room with a sense of vague wonder and reluctant admiration. She rather resembled a picture by Gruse in her soft white gown with a pale rose nestled amid the old Flemish lace at her throat, and as she turned her head toward us, the sunlight caught her fair hair, and turned it to the similitude of a golden halo circling her brows. She was not a beauty, but she possessed an undoubted individual charm, a delicate attractiveness, which silently asserted itself, as the breath of honeysuckle hidden in the tangles of a hedge will delight the wayfarer with sweet fragrance, though the flowers be unseen. "'Your book was very clever, Mr. Tempest,' she said suddenly, smiling at me. I read it as soon as it came out. But do you know, I think your article was even cleverer. I felt myself growing uncomfortably red in the face. To what article do you allude, Miss Clare? I stammered confusedly. I do not write for any magazine. No, and she laughed gaily. But you did on this occasion. You slated me very smartly. I quite enjoyed it. I found out that you were the author of the Philippic not through the editor of the journal. Oh, no, poor man. He is very discreet, but through quite another person who must be nameless. It is very difficult to prevent me from finding out whatever I wish to know, especially in literary matters. Why, you look quite unhappy. And her blue eyes danced with fun as she handed me my cup of tea. You really don't suppose I was hurt by your critique, do you? Dear me, no. Nothing of that kind ever affronts me. I am far too busy to waste any thought on reviews or reviewers. Only your article was so exceptionally funny. Funny? I echoed stupidly, trying to smile but failing in the effort. Yes, funny, she repeated. It was so very angry that it became amusing. My poor differences. I am really sorry it put you into such a temper. Temper does exhaust one's energy so. She laughed again and sat down in her former place near me regarding me with a frankly open and half-humorous gaze which I found I could not meet with any sort of composure. To say I felt foolish would inadequately express my sense of utter bafflement. This woman with her young, unclouded face, sweet voice, and evidently happy nature was not at all the creature I had imagined her to be, and I struggled to say something, anything, that would furnish a reasonable and coherent answer. I caught Lucio's glance, 
one of satirical amusement, and my thoughts grew more entangled than ever. A distraction, however, occurred in the behavior of the dog Trixie, who suddenly took up a position immediately opposite Lucio, and lifting his nose in air, began to howl with a desolate loudness astonishing in so small an animal. His mistress was surprised. "'Trixie, what is the matter?' she exclaimed, catching him up in her arms, where he hid his face, shivering and moaning. Then she looked steadily at Lucio. "'I never knew him to do such a thing before.' she said. Perhaps you do not like dogs, Prince Rimenez. I'm afraid they do not like me, he replied deferentially. Then pray excuse me a moment, she murmured, and left the room to return immediately without her canine favorite. After this I noticed that her blue eyes often rested on Lucio's handsome countenance with a bewildered and perplexed expression, as if she saw something in his very beauty that she disliked or distrusted. Meanwhile, I had recovered a little of my usual self-possession, and I addressed her in a tone which I meant to be kind, but which I knew was somewhat patronizing. I am very glad, Miss Clare, that you were not offended at the article you speak of. It was rather strong, I admit, but you know, we cannot all be of the same opinion. Indeed, no, she said quietly, and with a slight smile. Such a state of things would make a very dull world. I assure you, I was not, and am not, in the least offended. The critique was a smart piece of writing, and made not the slightest effect on me or on my book. You remember what Shelley wrote of critics? No, you will find the passage in his preface to The Revolt of Islam, and it runs thus. I have sought to write as I believe that Homer, Shakespeare, and Milton wrote, with an utter disregard of anonymous censure. I am certain that calumny and misrepresentation though it may move me to compassion, cannot disturb my peace. I shall understand the expressive silence of those sagacious enemies who dare not trust themselves to speak. I shall endeavor to extract from the midst of insult and contempt and maledictions those admonitions which may tend to correct whatever imperfections such censurers may discern in my appeal to the public. If certain critics were as clear-sighted as they are malignant, how great would be the benefit to be derived from their virulent writings! As it is, I fear I shall be malicious enough to be amused with their paltry tricks and lame invectives. Should the public judge that my composition is worthless, I shall indeed bow before the tribunal from which Milton received his crown of immortality, and shall seek to gather, if I live, strength from that defeat, which may nerve me to some new enterprise of thought which may not be worthless. As she gave the quotation, her eyes darkened and deepened. Her face was lighted up as by some inward illumination, and I discovered the rich sweetness of the voice which made the name of Mavis suit her so well. "'You see, I know my Shelley,' she said with a little laugh at her own emotion, "'and those words are particularly familiar to me because I have had them painted up on a panel in my study, just to remind me, in case I should forget, what the really great geniuses of the world thought of criticism.' because their example is very encouraging and helpful to a humble little worker like myself. I am not a press favorite, and I never get good reviews, but— And she laughed again. I like my reviewers all the same. If you have finished your tea, will you come and see them? Come and see them? What did she mean? She seemed delighted at my visible surprise, and her cheeks were dimpled with merriment. Come and see them, she repeated. They generally expect me at this hour. She led the way into the garden. We followed, I, in a bewildered confusion of mind, with all my ideas respecting unsexed females and repulsive blue stockings, upset by the unaffected behavior and charming frankness of this celebrity, whose fame I envied and whose personality I could not but admire. With all her intellectual gifts, she was yet a lovable woman. Ah, Mavis, how lovable and dear I was destined in misery to know. Mavis, Mavis, I whisper your sweet name in my solitude. I see you in my dreams, and kneeling before you, I call you angel, my angel at the gate of a lost paradise, whose sword of genius turning every way keeps me back from all approach to my forfeited tree of life. End of chapter 19「Chapter Twenty of the Sorrows of Satan by Marie Corelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
scarcely had we stepped out on the lawn before an unpleasant incident occurred which might have ended dangerously at his mistress's approach the big st bernard dog rose from the sunny corner where he had been peacefully dozing and prepared to greet her but as soon as he perceived us he stopped short with an ominous growl before miss clare could utter a warning word he made a couple of huge bounds and sprang savagely at lucio as though to tear him in pieces lucio with admirable presence of mind caught him firmly by the throat and forced him backwards mavis turned deathly pale let me hold him he will obey me she cried placing her little hand on the great dog's neck down emperor down how dare you down sir in a moment emperor dropped to the ground and crouched abjectly at her feet breathing heavily and trembling in every limb she held him by the collar and looked up at lucio who was perfectly composed though his eyes flashed dangerously i am so very sorry she murmured i forgot you told me dogs do not like you but what a singularly marked antipathy is it not i cannot understand it emperor is generally so good-natured i must apologize for his bad conduct it is quite unusual i hope he has not hurt you not at all returned lucio affably but with a cold smile i hope i have not hurt him or distressed you she made no reply but led the saint bernard away and was absent for a few minutes while she was gone lucio's brow clouded and his face grew very stern what do you think of her he asked me abruptly i hardly know what to think i answered abstractedly she is very different to what i imagined her dogs are rather unpleasant company they are honest animals he said morosely they are no doubt accustomed to candour in their mistress and therefore object to personified lies speak for yourself i said irritably they object to you chiefly am i not fully aware of that he retorted and do i not speak for myself you do not suppose i would call you a personified lie do you even if it were true i would not be so uncivil but i am a living lie and knowing it i admit it which gives me a certain claim to honesty above the ordinary run of men this woman wearer of laurels is a personified truth imagine it she has no occasion to pretend to be anything else than she is no wonder she is famous I said nothing, as just then the subject of our conversation returned, tranquil and smiling, and did her best, with the tact and grace of a perfect hostess, to make us forget her dog's ferocious conduct, by escorting us through all the prettiest turns and twisting paths of her garden, which was quite a bower of spring beauty. She talked to us both with equal ease, brightness, and cleverness, though I observed that she studied Lucio with close interest, and watched his looks and movements with more curiosity than liking. Passing under an arching grove of budding syringes, we presently came to an open courtyard paved with blue and white tiles, having in its centre a picturesque dovecote built in the form of a Chinese pagoda. Here pausing, Mavis clapped her hands. A cloud of doves, white, gray, brown, and opalescent, answered the summons, circling round and round her head, and flying down in excited groups at her feet. "'Here are my reviewers,' she said, laughing. "'Are they not pretty creatures? The ones I know best are named after their respective journals. There are plenty of anonymous ones, of course, who flock in with the rest. Here, for instance, is the Saturday Review.' And she picked up a strutting bird with coral-tinted feet, who seemed to rather like the attention shown to him. He fights with all his companions, and drives them away from the food whenever he can. He is a quarrelsome creature. Here she stroked the bird's head. You never know how to please him. He takes offense at the corn sometimes, and will only eat peas, or vice versa. He quite deserves his name. Go away, old boy. And she flung the pigeon in the air, and watched it soaring up and down. He is such a comical old grumbler. There is the speaker and she pointed to a fat, fussy fantail. He struts very well, and fancies he's important, you know, but he isn't. Over there is public opinion. That one, half asleep on the wall. Next to him is the spectator. You see he has two rings round his eyes like spectacles. That brown creature with the fluffy wings all by himself on that flower pot is the nineteenth century. The little bird with the green neck is the Westminster Gazette. 
and the fat one sitting on the platform of the coat is the pell-mell he knows his name very well see and she called merrily pell-mell come boy come here the bird obeyed at once and flying down from the coat settled on her shoulder there are so many others it is difficult to distinguish them sometimes she continued whenever i get a bad review i name a pigeon it amuses me that draggle-tailed one with the muddy feet is the sketch he is not at all a well-bred bird i must tell you that smart-looking dove with the purple breast is the graphic and that bland old grey thing is the i l n short for illustrated london news those three white ones are respectively daily telegraph morning post and standard now see them all and taking a covered basket from a corner she began to scatter corn and peas and various grains in lavish quantities all over the court for a moment we could scarcely see the sky so thickly the birds flocked together struggling fighting swooping downwards and soaring upwards but the winged confusion soon gave place to something like order when they were all on the ground and busy selecting their respective favorite foods from the different sorts provided for their choice you are indeed a sweet-natured philosopher said lucio smiling if you can symbolize your adverse reviewers by a flock of doves she laughed merrily well it is a remedy against all irritation she returned i used to worry a good deal over my work and wonder why it was that the press people were so unnecessarily hard upon me when they showed so much leniency and encouragement to far worse writers but after a little serious consideration finding that critical opinion carried no sort of conviction whatever to the public i determined to trouble no more about it except in the way of doves in the way of doves you feed your reviewers i observed exactly and i suppose i help to feed them even as women and men she said they get something from their editors for slashing my work and they probably make a little more out of selling their review copies so you see the dove emblem holds good throughout but you have not seen the athenium oh you must see him with laughter still lurking in her blue eyes she took us out of the pigeon court and led the way round to a sequestered and shady corner of the garden where in a large aviary cage fitted up for its special convenience sat a solemn white owl the instant it perceived us it became angry and ruffling up its downy feathers rolled its glistening yellow eyes vindictively and opened its beak two smaller owls sat in the background pressed close together one gray the other brown cross old boy said mavis addressing the spiteful-looking creature in the sweetest of accents haven't you found any mice to kill to-day oh what wicked eyes what a snappy mouth then turning to us she went on isn't he a lovely owl doesn't he look wise but as a matter of fact he's just as stupid as ever he can be that is why i call him the athenium he looks so profound you'd fancy he knows everything but he really thinks of nothing but killing mice all the time which limits his intelligence considerably lucio laughed heartily and so did i she looked so mischievous and merry but there are two other owls in the cage i said what are their names she held up a little finger in playful warning ah that would be telling secrets she said they're all the athenium the holy three a sort of literary trinity but why a trinity i do not venture to explain it is a riddle i must leave you to guess she moved on and we followed across a velvety grass plot bordered with bright spring flowers such as crocuses tulips anemones and hyacinths and presently pausing she asked would you care to see my workroom i found myself agreeing to this proposition with an almost boyish enthusiasm lucio glanced at me with a slight half cynical smile miss clare are you going to name a pigeon after mr tempest he inquired he played the part of an adverse critic you know but i doubt whether he will ever do so again she looked round at me and smiled oh i have been merciful to mr tempest she replied he is among the anonymous birds whom i do not specially recognize she stepped into the arched embrasure of an open window which fronted the view of the grass and flowers and entering with her we found ourselves in a large room octagonal in shape where the first object that attracted and riveted the attention was a marble bust of the palace athena 
whose grave impassive countenance and tranquil brows directly faced the sun a desk strewn with papers occupied the left-hand side of the window nook in a corner draped with olive-green velvet the white presence of the apollo belvedere taught in his inscrutable yet radiant smile the lesson of love and the triumphs of fame and numbers of books were about not ranged in formal rows on shelves as if they were never read but placed on low tables and wheeled stands that they might be easily taken up and glanced at the arrangement of the walls chiefly excited my interest and admiration for these were divided into panels and every panel had inscribed upon it in letters of gold some phrase from the philosophers or some verse from the poets the passage from shelley which mavis had recently quoted to us occupied as she had said one panel and above it hung a beautiful bas-relief of the drowned poet copied from the monument at via reggio another and broader panel held a fine engraving of shakespeare and under the picture appeared the lines to thine own self be true and it must follow as the night the day thou canst not then be false to any man byron was represented also keats but it would have taken more than a day to examine the various suggestive quaintness and individual charms of this workshop as its owner called it though the hour was to come when i should know every corner of it by heart and look upon it as a haunted outlaw of bygone ages looked upon sanctuary but now time gave us little pause and when we had sufficiently expressed our pleasure and gratitude for the kindness with which we had been received lucio glancing at his watch suggested departure we could stay on here for an indefinite period miss clare he said with an unwonted softness in his dark eyes it is a place for peace and happy meditation a restful corner for a tired soul he checked a slight sigh then went on but trains wait for no man and we are returning to town to-night then i will not detain you any longer said our young hostess leading the way at once by a side door through a passage filled with flowering plants into the drawing-room where she had first entertained us i hope mr tempest she added smiling at me that now we have met you will no longer desire to qualify as one of my pigeons it is scarcely worth while miss clare i said now speaking with unaffected sincerity i assure you on my honour i am very sorry i wrote that article against you if i had only known you as you are oh that should make no difference to a critic she answered merrily it would have made a great difference to me i declared you are so unlike the objectionable literary woman i paused and she regarded me smilingly with her bright clear candid eyes then i added i must tell you that sybil lady sybil elton is one of your most ardent admirers i am very pleased to hear that she said simply i am always glad when i succeed in winning someone's approval and liking does not every one approve and admire you asked lucio oh no by no means the saturday says i only win the applause of shop girls and she laughed poor old saturday the writers on its staff are so jealous of any successful author i told the prince of wales what it said the other day and he was very much amused you know the prince i asked in a little surprise well it would be more correct to say that he knows me she replied he has been very amiable in taking some little interest in my books he knows a good deal about literature too much more than people give him credit for he has been here more than once and has seen me feed my reviewers the pigeons you know he rather enjoyed the fun i think and this was all the result of the slating the press gave to mavis clare simply that she named her doves after her critics and fed them in the presence of whatever royal or distinguished visitors she might have and i afterward learned she had many amid no doubt much laughter from those who saw the spectator pigeon fighting for grains of corn or the saturday review pigeon quarrelling over peas evidently no reviewer spiteful or otherwise could affect the vivacious nature of such a mischievous elf as she was how different you are how widely different to the ordinary run of literary people i said involuntarily i am glad you find me so she answered i hope i am different as a rule literary people take themselves far too seriously and attach too much importance to what they do that is why they become such bores i don't believe anyone ever did thoroughly good work who was not perfectly happy over it 
and totally indifferent to opinion. I should be quite content to write on, if I only had a garret to live in. I was once very poor, shockingly poor, and even now I am not rich, but I've got just enough to keep me working steadily, which is as it should be. If I had more, I might get lazy and neglect my work. And then you know Satan might step into my life, and it would be a question of idle hands and mischief to follow, according to the adage. I think you would have strength enough to resist Satan, said Lucio, looking at her steadfastly with somber scrutiny in his expressive eyes. Oh, I don't know about that. I could not be sure of myself. And she smiled. I should imagine he must be a dangerously fascinating personage. I never picture him as the possessor of hoofs and a tail. Common sense assures me that no creature presenting himself under such an aspect would have the slightest power to attract. Milton's conception of Satan is the finest, and her eyes darkened swiftly with the intensity of her thoughts. A mighty angel fallen! One cannot but be sorry for such a fall, if the legend were true. There was a sudden silence. A bird sang outside, and a little breeze swayed the lilies in the window to and fro. "'Good-bye, Mavis Clare,' said Lucio, very softly, almost tenderly. His voice was low and tremulous, his face grave and pale. She looked up at him in a little surprise. "'Good-bye,' she rejoined, extending her small hand. He held it a moment, then, to my secret astonishment, knowing his aversion to women, stooped and kissed it. She flushed rosily as she withdrew it from his clasp. "'Be always as you are, Mavis Clare,' he said gently. Let nothing change you. Keep that bright nature of yours, that unruffled spirit of quiet contentment, and you may wear the bitter laurel of fame as sweetly as a rose. I have seen the world. I have travelled far, and have met many famous men and women, kings and queens, senators, poets, and philosophers. My experience has been wide and varied, so that I am not altogether without authority for what I say and I assure you that the Satan of whom you are able to speak with compassion can never trouble the peace of a pure and contented soul. Like consorts with like, a fallen angel seeks the equally fallen, and the devil, if there be one, becomes the companion of those only who take pleasure in his teaching and society. Legends say he is afraid of a crucifix, but if he is afraid of anything, I should say it must be of that sweet content concerning which your country Shakespeare sings, and which is a better defense against evil than the church or the prayers of the clergy. I speak as one having the right of age to speak. I am so many, many years older than you. You must forgive me if I have said too much. She was quite silent, evidently moved and surprised at his words, and she gazed at him with a vaguely wondering, half-awed expression an expression which changed directly i myself advanced to make my adieu i am very glad to have met you miss clare i said i hope we shall be friends there is no reason why we should be enemies i think she responded frankly i am very pleased you came to-day if ever you want to slate me again you know your fate you become a dove nothing more good-bye she saluted us prettily as we passed out and when the gate had closed behind us, we heard the deep and joyous baying of the great dog emperor, evidently released from Durant's ville immediately on our departure. We walked on for some time in silence, and it was not till we had re-entered the grounds of Willowsmere, and were making our way to the drive, where the carriage which was to take us to the station already awaited us, that Lucio said, Well, now what do you think of her? She is as unlike the accepted ideal of the female novelist as she can well be, I answered with a laugh. Accepted ideals are generally mistaken ones, he observed, watching me narrowly. An accepted ideal of divinity in some church pictures is an old man's face set in a triangle. The accepted ideal of the devil is a nondescript creature with horns, hoofs, one of them cloven, and a tail, as Miss Clare just now remarked. The accepted ideal of beauty is the Venus de Medici, whereas your Lady Sibyl entirely transcends that much overrated statue. The accepted ideal of a poet is Apollo. He was a god, and no poet in the flesh ever approaches the godlike. And the accepted ideal of the female novelist is an elderly, dowdy, spectacled, frowsy fright. Mavis Clare does not fulfill this description, yet she is the author of differences. 
now mcwing who thrashes her continually in all the papers he can command is elderly ugly spectacled and frowsy and he is the author of nothing women authors are invariably supposed to be hideous men authors for the most part are hideous but their hideousness is not noted or insisted upon whereas no matter how good-looking women writers may be they still pass under press comments as frights because the fiat of press opinion considers they ought to be frights even if they are not a pretty authoress is an offence an incongruity a something that neither men nor women care about men don't care about her because being clever and independent she does not often care about them women don't care about her because she has the effrontery to combine attractive looks with intelligence and she makes an awkward rival to those who have only attractive looks without intelligence so wags the world o oh, wild world circling through eons untold mid fires of sunrise and sunset through flashes of silver and gold grain of dust in a storm atom of sand by the sea what is your worth o oh world to the angels of god and me he sang this quite suddenly his rich baritone pealing out musically on the warm silent air i listened entranced what a voice you have i exclaimed what a glorious gift he smiled and sang on his dark eyes flashing o oh, wild world mote in a burning ray flung from the spherical heavens millions of spaces away sink in the ether or soar live with the planets or die what should i care for your fate who am one with the infinite sky what strange song is that i asked startled and thrilled by the passion of his voice it seems to mean nothing he laughed and took my arm it does mean nothing he said all drawing-room songs mean nothing mine is a drawing-room song calculated to waken emotional impulses in the unloved spinster religiously inclined nonsense i said smiling exactly that is what i say it is nonsense here we came up to the carriage which waited for us just twenty minutes to catch the train geoffrey off we go and off we did go i watching the red gabled roofs of willowsmere court shining in the late sunshine till a turn in the road hid them from view you like your purchase queried lucio presently i do immensely and your rival mavis clare do you like her i paused a moment then answered frankly yes i like her and i will admit something more than that to you now i like her book it is a notable work worthy of the most highly gifted man i always liked it and because i liked it i slated it rather a mysterious course of procedure and he smiled can you not explain of course i can explain i said explanation is easy i envied her power i envy it still her popularity caused me a smarting sense of injury and to relieve it i wrote that article against her but i shall never do anything of the kind again i shall let her grow her laurels in peace laurels have a habit of growing without any permission observed lucio significantly in all sorts of unexpected places too and they can never be properly cultivated in the forcing-house of criticism. I know that, I said quickly, my thoughts reverting to my own book, and all the favorable criticisms that had been heaped upon it. I have learned that lesson thoroughly, by heart. He looked at me fixedly. It is only one of many you may have yet to learn, he said. It is a lesson in fame. Your next course of instruction will be in love he smiled but i was conscious of a certain dread and discomfort as he spoke i thought of sibyl and her incomparable beauty sibyl who had told me she could not love had we both to learn a lesson and should we master it or would it master us end of chapter twenty chapter twenty one of the sorrows of satan by marie corelli this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The preparations for my marriage now went on apace. Shoals of presents began to arrive for Sybil, as well as for myself, and I was introduced to a hitherto undemonstrated phase, as far as I personally was concerned, of the vulgarity and hypocrisy of fashionable society. Everyone knew the extent of my wealth, 
and how little real necessity there was for offering me or my bride-elect costly gifts nevertheless all our so-called friends and acquaintances strove to outvie each other in the gross cash value if not in the good taste of their various donations had we been a young couple bravely beginning the world on true love in more or less uncertainty as to our prospects and future income we should have received nothing either useful or valuable every one would have tried to do the present giving in as cheap and mean a way as possible instead of handsome services of solid silver we should have had a meagre collection of plated teaspoons instead of costly editions of books sumptuously enriched with fine steel engravings we might possibly have had to express our gratitude for a ten shilling family bible of course i fully realized the actual nature and object of the lavish extravagance displayed on this occasion by our social set their gifts were merely so many bribes sent with a purpose which was easy enough to fathom the donors wished to be invited to the wedding in the first place and after that they sought to be included in our visiting list and foresaw invitations to our dinners and house parties and more than this they calculated on our influence in society and the possible chance there might be in the dim future of our lending some of them money should pressing occasion require it in the scant thankfulness and suppressed contempt their adulatory offerings excited sibyl and i were completely at one she looked upon her array of glittering valuables with the utmost weariness and indifference and flattered my self-love by assuring me that the only things she cared at all for were the riviere of sapphires and diamonds i had given her as a betrothal pledge together with an engagement ring of the same lustrous gems yet i noticed she also had a great liking for lucio's present which was a truly magnificent masterpiece of the jeweller's art it was a girdle in the form of a serpent the body entirely composed of the finest emeralds and the head of rubies and diamonds flexible as a reed when sibyl put it on it appeared to spring and coil round her waist like a living thing and breathe with her breathing i did not much care for it myself as an ornament for a young bride it seemed to me quite unsuitable but as every one else admired it and envied the possessor of such superb jewels i said nothing of my own distaste diana chesney had shown a certain amount of delicate sentiment and refinement in her offering it was a very exquisite marble statue of psyche mounted on a pedestal of solid silver and ebony sibyl thanked her smiling coldly you have given me an emblem of the soul she said no doubt you remembered i had no soul of my own and her airy laugh had chilled poor diana to the marrow as the warm-hearted little american herself with tears assured me at this period i saw very little of rimenez i was much occupied with my lawyers on the question of settlements messrs bentham and ellis rather objected to the arrangement by which i gave the half of my fortune to my intended wife unconditionally but i would brook no interference and the deed was drawn up signed sealed and witnessed the earl of elton could not sufficiently praise my unexampled generosity my noble character and walked about eulogizing me everywhere till he almost turned himself into a public advertisement of the virtues of his future son-in-law he seemed to have taken a new lease on life he flirted with diana chesney openly and of his paralyzed spouse with a fixed stare and deathly grin he never spoke and i imagine never thought sibyl herself was always in the hands of dressmakers and milliners and we only saw each other every day for a few minutes hurried chat on these occasions she was always charming even affectionate and yet though i was full of passionate admiration and love for her i felt that she was mine merely as a slave might be mine that she gave me her lips to kiss as if she considered i had a right to kiss them because i had bought them and for no other reason that her pretty caresses were studied and her whole behavior the result of careful forethought and not natural impulsiveness i tried to shake off this impression but it still remained persistently and clouded the sweetness of my brief courtship meanwhile slowly and almost imperceptibly my boomed book dropped out of notice morgeson presented a heavy bill of publishing costs which i paid without a murmur now and then an allusion to my literary triumphs cropped up in one or other of the newspapers but otherwise no one spoke of my famous work and few read it 
I enjoyed the same sort of clicky reputation and public failure attending a certain novel entitled Marius the Epicurean. The journalists with whom I had come in contact began to drift away like flotsam and jetsam. I think they saw I was not likely to give many more reviewing dinners or suppers, and that my marriage with the Earl of Elton's daughter would lift me into an atmosphere where Grub Street could not breathe comfortably or stretch its legs at ease. The heap of gold on which I sat as on a throne divided me gradually from even the back courts and lower passages leading to the Temple of Fame, and almost unconsciously to myself I retreated step by step, shading my eyes as it were from the sun, and seeing the glittering turrets in the distance, with a woman's slight figure entering the lofty portico, turning back her laurelled head to smile sorrowfully and with divinest pity upon me, ere passing in to salute the gods. Yet, if asked about it, everyone on the press would have said that I had had a great success. I, only I, realized the bitterness and truth of my failure. I had not touched the heart of the public. I had not succeeded in so waking my readers out of the torpor of their dull and commonplace everyday lives that they should turn towards me with outstretched hands, exclaiming, More, more of these thoughts which comfort and inspire us, which make us hear God's voice proclaiming, All's well! above the storms of life. I had not done it. I could not do it. And the worst part of my feeling on this point was the idea that possibly I might have done it had I remained poor. The strongest and healthiest pulse in the composition of a man, the necessity for hard work, had been killed in me. I knew I need not work, that the society in which I now moved thought it ridiculous if I did work, that I was expected to spend money and enjoy myself in the idiotic fashion of what the upper ten termed enjoyment. My acquaintances were not slow in suggesting plans for the dissipation of my surplus cash. Why did I not build for myself a marble palace on the Riviera, or a yacht to completely outshine the Prince of Wales's Britannia? Why did I not start a theatre, or found a newspaper? Not one of my social advisers once proposed my doing any private, personal good with my fortune. When some terrible case of distress was published, and subscriptions were raised to relieve the object or objects of suffering, I invariably gave ten guineas, and allowed myself to be thanked for my generous assistance. I might as well have given ten pence, for the guineas were no more to me in comparison than the pence. When funds were started to erect a statue to some great man who had, in the usual way of the world, been a victim of misrepresentation till his death, I produced my ten guineas again, when I could have easily defrayed the whole cost of the memorial, with honour to myself, and been none the poorer. With all my wealth I did nothing noteworthy. I showered no unexpected luck in the way of the patient, struggling workers in the hard schools of literature and art. I gave no largesse among the poor. And when a thin, eager-eyed curate, with a strong, earnest face, called upon me one day, to represent, with much nervous diffidence, the hideous sufferings of some of the sick and starving in his district down by the docks, and suggested that I might possibly care to alleviate a few of these direful sorrows as a satisfaction to myself, as well as for the sake of human brotherhood, I am ashamed to say I let him go with a sovereign, for which he heaped coals of fire on my head by his simple, God bless you and thank you. I could see he was himself in the grip of poverty. I could have made him and his poor district gloriously happy by a few strokes of my pen on a check for an amount I should never have missed. And yet, I gave him nothing but that one piece of gold, and so allowed him to depart. He invited me, with earnest good will, to go and see his starving flock. For believe me, Mr. Tempest, said he, I should be sorry if you thought, as some of the wealthy are unhappily apt to do, that I seek money simply to apply it to my own personal uses. If you would visit the district yourself, and distribute whatever you pleased with your own hand, it would be infinitely more gratifying to me and would have a far better effect on the minds of the people. For, sir, the poor will not always be patient under the cruel burdens they have to bear. I smiled indulgently, and assured him, not without a touch of satire in my tone, that I was convinced all clergymen were honest and unselfish. And then I sent my servant to bow him out with all possible politeness. And that very day, I remember, I drank at my luncheon Chateau Yquem at twenty-five shillings a bottle. I enter into these apparently trifling details, because they all help to make up the sum and substance of the deadly consequences to follow. 
and also because I wished to emphasize the fact that in my actions I only imitated the example of my compeers. Most rich men today follow the same course as I did, and active personal good to the community is wrought by very few of them. No great deed of generosity illumines our annals. Royalty itself leads no fashion in this. The royal gifts of game and cast-off clothing sent to our hospitals are too slight and conventional to carry weight. The entertainments for the poor got up by some of the aristocrats at the East End are nothing and less than nothing. They are weak sops to our tame lion couchant, offered in doubtful fear and trembling, for our lion is wakeful and somewhat restive. There is no knowing what may happen if the original ferocity of the beast is roused. A few of our over-rich men might considerably ease the load of cruel poverty in many quarters of the metropolis if they united themselves with a noble unselfishness in the strong and determined effort to do so, an eschewed red tapism and wordy argument. But they remain inert, spending solely on their own personal gratification and amusement, and meanwhile there are dark signs of trouble brooding. The poor, as the lean and anxious curate said, will not always be patient. I must not here forget to mention that through some secret management of Rimenez, my name, much to my own surprise, appeared on the list of competitors for the derby. How, at so late an hour, this had been effected, I knew no more than where my horse Phosphor came from. It was a superb animal, but Rimenez, whose gift to me it was, warned me to be careful as to the character of the persons admitted into the stables to view it and to allow no one but the horse's own two attendants to linger near it long on any pretext. Speculation was very rife as to what Phosphor's capabilities really were. The grooms never showed him off to advantage during exercise. I was amazed when Lucio told me his man Emile would be the jockey. "'Good heavens! Not possible!' I exclaimed. "'Can he ride?' "'Like the very devil,' responded my friend with a smile. "'He will ride Phosphor to the winning post.' I was very doubtful in my own mind of this. A horse of the Prime Minister's was to run, and all the betting was on that side. Few had seen Phosphor, and those few, though keen admirers of the animal's appearance, had little opportunity of judging its actual qualities, thanks to the careful management of its two attendants, who were dark-faced, reticent-looking men, somewhat after Emile's character and complexion. I myself was quite indifferent as to the result of the contest. I did not really care whether Phosphor lost or won the race. I could afford to lose, and it would be little to me if I won, save a momentary passing triumph. There was nothing lasting, intellectual, or honorable in the victory. There is nothing lasting, intellectual, or honorable in anything connected with racing. However, because it was fashionable to be interested in this particular mode of wasting time and money, I followed the general lead for the sake of being talked about, and nothing more. Meanwhile, Lucio, saying little to me concerning it, was busy planning the betrothal feat at Willowsmere, and designing all sorts of surprise entertainment for the guests. Eight hundred invitations were sent out, and society soon began to chatter volubly and excitedly on the probable magnificence of the forthcoming festival. Eager acceptances poured in, only a few of those asked were hindered from attending by illness, family deaths, or previous engagements, and among these latter, to my regret, was Mavis Clare. She was going to the sea coast to stay with some old friends, and in a prettily worded letter explained this, and expressed her thanks for my invitation, though she found herself unable to accept it. How curious it was that when I read her little note of refusal, I should experience such a keen sense of disappointment. She was nothing to me, nothing but a literary woman who, by strange chance, happened to be sweeter than most women unliterary, and yet I felt that the feet at Willowsmere would lose something in brightness, lacking her presence. I had wanted to introduce her to Sybil, as I knew I should thus give a special pleasure to my betrothed. However, it was not to be, and I was conscious of an inexplicable personal vexation. In strict accordance with the promise made, I let Rimenez have his own way entirely with regards to all the arrangements for what was to be the ne plus ultra of everything ever designed for the distraction, amusement, and wonderment of listless and fastidious swagger people, and I neither interfered nor asked any questions, content to rely on my friend's taste, imagination, and ingenuity. 
I only understood that all the plans were being carried out by foreign artists and caterers, and that no English firms would be employed. I did venture once to inquire about the reason of this, and got one of Lucio's own enigmatical replies. Nothing English is good enough for the English, he said. Things have to be imported from France to please the people whom the French themselves angrily designate as perfide Albion. You must not have a bill of fare, you must have a menu, and all your dishes must bear French titles, otherwise they will not be in good form. You must have French comédiens and danseuses to please the British taste, and your silken draperies must be woven on French looms. Lately, too, it has been deemed necessary to import Parisian morality as well as Parisian fashions. It does not suit stalwart Great Britain at all, you know. Stalwart Great Britain, aping the manners of Paris, looks like a jolly, open-faced, sturdy-limbed giant with a doll's bonnet stuck on his leonine head. But the doll's bonnet is just now la mode. Some day, I believe, the giant will discover it looks ridiculous and cast it off with a burst of genuine laughter at his own temporary folly, and without it he will resume his original dignity, the dignity that best becomes a privileged conqueror who has the sea for his standing army. Evidently you like England, I said, smiling. He laughed. Not in the very least. I do not like England any more than any other country on the globe. I do not like the globe itself, and England comes in for a share of my aversion as one of the spots on the trumpery ball. If I could have my way, I should like to throne myself on a convenient star for the purpose, and kick out at earth as she whirls by in space, hoping by that act of just violence to do away with her forever. But why? I asked, amused. Why do you hate the earth? What has the poor little planet done to merit your abhorrence? He looked at me very strangely. Shall I tell you? You will never believe me. No matter for that, I answered, smiling. Say on. What has the poor little planet done? He repeated slowly. The poor little planet has done nothing. But it is what the gods have done with this same poor little planet that awakens my anger and scorn. They have made it a living sphere of wonders, endowed it with beauty borrowed from the fairest corners of highest heaven, decked it with flowers and foliage, taught it music, the music of birds and torrents and rolling waves and falling rains rocked it gently in clear ether among such lights as blinds the eyes of mortals guided it out of chaos through clouds of thunder and barbed shafts of lightning to circle peacefully in its appointed orbit lit on one hand by the vivid splendors of the sun and on the other by the sleepy radiance of the moon and more than all this they have invested it with a divine soul in man ho oh, you may disbelieve as you will but notwithstanding the pygmy peeps earth takes as the vast and eternal ocean of science, the soul is here, and all the immortal forces with it and around it. Nay, the gods, I speak in the plural, after the fashion of the ancient Greeks, for to my thinking there are many gods emanating from the supreme deity. The gods, I say, have so insisted on this fact that one of them has walked the earth in human guise solely for the sake of emphasizing the truth of immortality to these frail creatures of seemingly perishable clay. For this, I hate the planet. Were there not, and are there not, other and far grander worlds that a god should have chosen to dwell on than this one? For a moment I was silent, out of sheer surprise. You amaze me, I said at last. You allude to Christ, I suppose. But everybody is convinced by this time that he was a mere man like the rest of us. There was nothing divine about him. What a contradiction you are! Why, I remember you indignantly denied the accusation of being a Christian. Of course, and I deny it still, he answered quickly. I have not a fat living in the church that I should tell a lie on such a subject. I am not a Christian, nor is anyone living a Christian. To quote a very old saying, there never was a Christian save one and he was crucified. But though I am not a Christian, I never said I doubted the existence of Christ. That knowledge was forced upon me, with considerable pressure, too. By a reliable authority? I inquired, with a slight sneer. He made no immediate reply. His flashing eyes looked, as it were, through me and beyond me, at something far away. The curious pallor that at times gave his face the set look of an impenetrable mask came upon him then, and he smiled, an awful smile. 
so might a man smile out of deadly bravado when told of some dim and dreadful torture awaiting him you touch me on a sore point he said at last slowly and in a harsh tone my convictions respecting certain religious phases of man's development and progress are founded on the arduous study of some very unpleasant truths to which humanity generally shuts its eyes burying its head in the desert sands of its own delusions these truths i will not enter upon now some other time i will initiate you into a few of my mysteries the tortured smile passed from his face leaving it intellectually composed and calm as usual and i hastily changed the subject for i had made up my mind by this time that my brilliant friend had like many exceptionally gifted persons a craze on one topic and that topic a particularly difficult one to discuss as it touched on the superhuman and therefore to my thinking the impossible my own temperament which had in the days of my poverty fluctuated between spiritual striving and material gain had with my sudden access to fortune rapidly hardened into the character of a man of the world worldly for whom all speculations as to the unseen forces working in and around us were the merest folly not worth a moment's waste of thought i should have laughed to scorn any one who had then presumed to talk to me about the law of eternal justice which with individuals as well as nations works not for a passing phase but for all time towards good and not evil for no matter how much a man may strive to blind himself to the fact he has a portion of the divine within him which if he wilfully corrupts by his own wickedness he must be forced to cleanse again and yet again in the fierce flames of such remorse and such despair as are rightly termed the quenchless fires of hell end of chapter twenty one Chapter Twenty Two of the Sorrows of Satan by Marie Corelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On the afternoon of the twenty first of May, I went down, accompanied by Lucio, to Willowsmere to be in readiness for the reception of the social swarm who were to flock thither the next day. Emile went with us, but I left my own man, Morris, behind to take charge of my rooms in the Grand and to forward late telegrams and special messages. The weather was calm, warm and bright, and a young moon showed her thin crescent in the sky as we got out at the country station and stepped into the open carriage awaiting us. The station officials greeted us with servile humility, eyeing Lucio especially with an almost gaping air of wonderment. The fact of his lavish expenditure in arranging with the railway company a service of special trains for the use of the morrow's guests had no doubt excited them to a speechless extent of admiration as well as astonishment when we approached willowsmere and entered the beautiful drive bordered with oak and beech which led up to the house i uttered an exclamation of delight at the festal decorations displayed for the whole avenue was spanned with arches of flags and flowers garlands of blossoms being even swung from tree to tree and interlacing many of the lower branches the gabled porch at the entrance of the house was draped with crimson silk and festooned with white roses and as we alighted the door was flung open by a smart page in brilliant scarlet and gold i think said lucio to me as we entered you will find everything as complete as this world's resources will allow the retinue of servants here are what is vulgarly called on the job their payment is agreed upon and they know their duties thoroughly they will give you no trouble i could scarcely find words to express my unbounded satisfaction or to thank him for the admirable taste with which the beautiful house had been adorned i wandered about in an ecstasy of admiration triumphing in such a visible and gorgeous display of what great wealth could really do the ballroom had been transformed into an elegant bijou theatre the stage being concealed by a curtain of thick gold-coloured silk on which the oft-quoted lines of shakespeare were embroidered in raised letters all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players turning out of this into the drawing-room i found it decorated entirely round with banks of roses red and white the flowers forming a huge pyramid at one end of the apartment behind which as lucio informed me unseen musicians would discourse sweet harmony 
I have arranged for a few tableaux vivants in the theatre to fill up a gap of time, he said carelessly. Fashionable folks nowadays get so soon tired of one amusement that it is necessary to provide several in order to distract the brains that cannot think, or discover any means of entertainment in themselves. As a matter of fact, people cannot even converse long together, because they have nothing to say. Oh, don't bother to go out in the grounds on a tour of inspection just now. Leave a few surprises for yourself, as well as for your company tomorrow. Come and have dinner. He put his arm through mine, and we entered the dining room. Here the table was laid out with costly fruit, flowers, and delicacies of every description. Four men servants in scarlet and gold stood silently in waiting, with a meal, in black as usual, behind his master's chair. We enjoyed a sumptuous repast served to perfection, and when it was finished we strolled out in the grounds to smoke and talk. "'You seem to do everything by magic, Lucio,' I said, looking at him wonderingly. "'All these lavish decorations, these servants—' "'Money, my dear fellow, nothing but money,' he interrupted with a laugh. "'Money, the devil's pass-key. You can have the retinue of a king without any of a king's responsibilities, if you only choose to pay for it.' It is merely a question of cost. And taste, I reminded him. True, and taste. Some rich men there are who have less taste than a costermonger. I know one who has the egregious vulgarity to call the attention of his guests to the value of his goods and chattels. He pointed out for my admiration one day an antique and hideous china plate, the only one of that kind in the world, and told me it was worth a thousand guineas break it i said coolly you will then have the satisfaction of knowing you have destroyed a thousand guineas worth of undesirable ugliness you should have seen his face he showed me no more curios i laughed and we walked slowly up and down for a few minutes in silence presently i became aware that my companion was looking at me intently and i turned my head quickly to meet his eyes he smiled i was just thinking he said what you would have done with your life if you had not inherited this fortune, and if, if I had not come your way. I should have starved, no doubt, I responded, died like a rat in a hole of want and wretchedness. I rather doubt that, he said meditatively. It is just possible you might have become a great writer. Why do you say that now? I asked. Because I have been reading your book. There are fine ideas in it, ideas that might— had they been the result of sincere conviction, have reached the public in time, because they were sane and healthy. The public will never put up for long with corrupt fads and artificial crazes. Now you write of God. Yet according to your own statement, you did not believe in God, even when you wrote the words that imply his existence. And that was long before I met you. Therefore, the book was not the result of sincere conviction, and that's the keynote of your failure to reach the large audience you desired. Each reader can see you do not believe what you write. The trumpet of lasting fame never sounds triumph for an author of that caliber. Don't let us talk about it for heaven's sake, I said irritably. I know my work lacks something, and that something may be what you say, or it may not. I do not want to think about it. Let it perish, as it assuredly will. Perhaps in the future I may do better. He was silent and finishing his cigar, threw the end away in the grass, where it burned like a dull red coal. I must turn in, he then observed. I have a few more directions to give to the servants for tomorrow. I shall go to my room as soon as I have done, so I'll say good night. But surely you are taking too much personal trouble, I said. Can't I help in any way? No, you can't, he answered, smiling. When I undertake to do anything, I like to do it in my own fashion, or not at all sleep well and rise early he nodded and sauntered slowly away over the dewy grass i watched his dark tall figure receding till he had entered the house then lighting a fresh cigar i wandered on alone through the grounds noting here and there flowery arbors and dainty silk pavilions erected in picturesque nooks and corners for the morrow i looked up at the sky it was clear and bright there would be no rain Presently I opened the wicked gate that led into the outer by-road, and walking on slowly, almost unconsciously, I found myself in a few minutes opposite Lily Cottage. Approaching the gate I looked in. The pretty old house was dark, silent, and deserted. I knew Mavis Clare was away. 
and it was not strange that the aspect of her home nest emphasized the fact of her absence. A cluster of climbing roses hanging from the wall looked as if they were listening for the first sound of her returning footsteps. Across the green breadth of the lawn where I had seen her playing with her dogs, a tall sheaf of St. John's lilies stood up white against the sky, their pure hearts opened to the starlight and the breeze. The scent of honeysuckle and sweetbriar filled the air with delicate suggestions, and as I leaned over the low fence, gazing vaguely at the long shadows of the trees on the grass, a nightingale began to sing. The sweet yet dolorous warble of the little brown lover of the moon palpitated on the silence in silver-toned drops of melody, and I listened till my eyes smarted with a sudden moisture as of tears. Strangely enough, I never thought of my betrothed bride Sibyl then, as surely, by all the precedents of passion, I should have done at such a moment of dreamful ecstasy. It was another woman's face that floated before my memory, a face not beautiful, but merely sweet, and made radiant by the light of two tender, wistful, wonderfully innocent eyes, a face like that of some new Daphne, with the mystic laurel springing from her brows. The nightingale sang on and on, the tall lilies swayed in the faint wind as though nodding wise approval of the bird's wild music. And gathering one briar rose from the hedge, I turned away with a curious heaviness at my heart, a trouble I could not analyze or account for. I explained my feeling partly to myself as one of regret that I had ever taken up my pen to assault, with sneer and flippant jest, the gentle and brilliantly endowed owner of this little home where peace and pure content dwelt happily in student-like seclusion. But this was not all. There was something else in my mind, something inexplicable and sad, which then I had no skill to define. I know now what it was, but the knowledge comes too late. Returning to my own domains, I saw through the trees a vivid red light in one of the upper windows of Willowsmere. It twinkled like a lurid star, and I guided my steps by its brilliancy as I made my way across the winding garden paths and terraces back to the house. Entering the hall, the page in scarlet and gold met me, and with a respectful obeisance escorted me to my room, where Emile was in waiting. "'Has the prince retired?' I asked him. "'Yes, sir. He has a red lamp in his window, has he not?' Emile looked deferentially meditative yet I fancied I saw him smile. I think, yes, I believe he has, sir. I asked no more questions, but allowed him to perform his duties as valet in silence. Good night, sir, he said at last, his ferret eyes fastened upon me with an expressionless look. Good night, I responded indifferently. He left the room with his usual cat-like stealthy tread, and when he had gone, I, moved by a sudden fresh impulse of hatred for him, sprang to the door and locked it. Then I listened with an odd nervous breathlessness. There was not a sound. For fully quarter of an hour I remained with my attention more or less strained, expectant of I knew not what. But the quiet of the house was absolutely undisturbed. With a sigh of relief I flung myself on the luxurious bed, a couch fit for a king, draped with the richest satin elaborately embroidered. And falling soundly asleep, I dreamed that I was poor again. Poor, but unspeakably happy, and hard at work in the old lodging, writing down thoughts which I knew, by some divine intuition and beyond all doubt, would bring me the whole world's honor. Again I heard the sounds of the violin played by my unseen neighbor next door, and this time they were triumphal chords and cadences of joy, without one throb of sorrow. And while I wrote on, in an ecstasy of inspiration, oblivious of poverty and pain, I heard, echoing through my visions, the round warble of the nightingale, and saw, in the far distance, an angel floating towards me on pinions of light, with the face of Mavis Clare. End of chapter 22 Chapter Twenty Three of the Sorrows of Satan by Marie Corelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The morning broke clear with all the pure tints of a fine opal radiating in the cloudless sky. 
never had i beheld such a fair scene as the woods and gardens of willowsmere when i looked upon them that day illumined by the unclouded sunlight of a spring half melting into summer my heart swelled with pride as i surveyed the beautiful domain i now owned and thought how happy a home it would make when sibyl matchless in her loveliness shared with me its charm and luxury yes i said half aloud say what philosophers will the possession of money does ensure satisfaction and power it is all very well to talk about fame but what is fame worth if like carlyle one is too poor to enjoy it besides literature no longer holds its former high prestige there are too many in the field too many newspaper scribblers all believing they are geniuses too many ill-educated lady paragraphists and new women who think they are as gifted as george sand or mavis clare with sibyl and willowsmere i ought to be able to resign the idea of fame literary fame with a good grace i knew i reasoned falsely with myself i knew that my hankering for a place among the truly great of the world was as strong as ever i knew i craved for the intellectual distinction force and pride which made the thinker a terror and a power in the land and which so sever a great poet or great romanticist from the commoner throng that even kings are glad to do him or her honour but i would not allow my thoughts to dwell on this rapidly vanishing point of unattainable desire i settled my mind to enjoy the luscious flavour of the immediate present as a bee settles in the cup of honey-flowers and leaving my bedroom i went downstairs to breakfast with lucio in the best and gayest of humours not a cloud on the day he said meeting me with a smile as i entered the bright morning-room whose windows opened on the lawn the feat will be a brilliant success geoffrey thanks to you i answered personally i am quite in the dark as to your plans but i believe you can do nothing that is not well done you honour me he said with a light laugh you credit me then with better qualities than the creator for what he does in the opinion of the present generation is exceedingly ill done men have taken to grumbling at him instead of praising him and few have any patience with or liking for his laws i laughed well you must admit those laws are very arbitrary they are i entirely acknowledge the fact we sat down to table and were waited upon by admirably trained servants who apparently had no idea of anything else but attendance on our needs there was no trace of bustle or excitement in the household no sign whatever to denote that a great entertainment was about to take place that day it was not until the close of our meal that i asked lucio what time the musicians would arrive he glanced at his watch about noon i should say he replied perhaps before but whatever their hour they will all be in their places at the proper moment depend upon it the people i employ both musicians and artistes know their business thoroughly and are aware that i stand no nonsense a rather sinister smile played round his mouth as he regarded me none of your guests can arrive here till one o'clock as that is about the time the special train will bring the first batch of them from london and the first déjeuner will be served in the gardens at two if you want to amuse yourself there's a maypole being put up on the large lawn you'd better go and look at it a maypole i exclaimed now that's a good idea it used to be a good idea he answered when english lads and lasses had youth innocence health and fun in their composition a dance round the maypole hand in hand did them good and did nobody harm but now there are no lads and lasses enervated old men and women in their teens walk the world wearily speculating on the uses of life probing vice and sneering down sentiment and such innocent diversions as the maypole no longer appeal to our jaded youth so we have to get professionals to execute the may revels of course the dancing is better done by properly trained legs but it means nothing and is nothing except a pretty spectacle and are the dancers here i asked rising and going toward the window in some curiosity no not yet but the maypole is fully decorated it faces the woods at the back of the house go and see if you like it i followed his suggestion and going in the direction indicated i soon perceived the gaily decked object which used to be the welcome signal of many a village holiday in shakespeare's old world england 
the pole was already set up and fixed in a deep socket in the ground and a dozen or more men were at work unbinding its numerous trails of blossom and garlands of green tied with long streamers of vari-coloured ribbon it had a picturesque effect in the centre of the wide lawn bordered with grand old trees and approaching one of the men i said something to him by way of approval and admiration he glanced at me furtively and unsmilingly but said nothing and i concluded from his dark and foreign cast of features that he did not understand the english language i noticed with some wonder and slight vexation that all the workmen were of the same alien and sinister type of countenance very much after the unattractive models of emile and the two grooms who had my racer phosphor in charge but i remembered what lucio had told me namely that all the designs for the feet were carried out by foreign experts and artists and after some puzzled consideration i let the matter pass from my mind the morning hours flew swiftly by and i had little time to examine all the festal preparations with which the gardens abounded so that i was almost as ignorant of what was in store for the amusement of my guests as the guests themselves i had the curiosity to wait about and watch for the coming of the musicians and dancers but i might as well have spared myself this waste of time and trouble for i never saw them arrive at all at one o'clock both lucio and i were ready to receive our company and at about twenty minutes past the hour the first instalment of swagger society was emptied into the grounds sibyl and her father were among these and i eagerly advanced to meet and greet my bride-elect as she alighted from the carriage that had brought her from the station she looked supremely beautiful that day and was as she deserved to be the cynosure of all eyes i kissed her little gloved hand with a deeper reverence than i would have kissed the hand of a queen welcome back to your old home my sibyl i said to her in a low voice tenderly at which words she paused looking up at the red gables of the house with such wistful affection as filled her eyes with something like tears she left her hand in mine and allowed me to lead her towards the silken draped flower-decked porch where lucia waited smiling and as she advanced two tiny pages in pure white and silver glided suddenly out of some unseen hiding-place and emptied two baskets of pink and white rose leaves at her feet thus strewing a fragrant pathway for her into the house they vanished as completely and swiftly as they had appeared some of the guests uttered murmurs of admiration while sibyl gazed about her blushing with surprise and pleasure how charming of you geoffrey she said what a poet you are to devise so pretty a greeting i wish i deserved your praise i answered smiling at her but the poet in question is prince rimenez he is the master and ruler of today's revels again the rich colour flushed her cheeks and she gave lucio her hand he bowed over it in courtly fashion but did not kiss it as he had kissed the hand of mavis clare we passed into the house through the drawing-room and out again into the gardens lord elton being loud in his praise of the artistic manner in which his former dwelling had been improved and embellished soon the lawn was sprinkled with gaily attired groups of people and my duties as host began in hard earnest i had to be greeted complimented flattered and congratulated on my approaching marriage by scores of hypocrites who nearly shook my hand off in their enthusiasm for my wealth had i become suddenly poor i thought grimly not one of them would have lent me a sovereign the guests kept on arriving in shoals and when there were about three or four hundred assembled a burst of exquisite music sounded and a procession of pages in scarlet and gold marching two by two appeared carrying trays full of the rarest flowers tied up in bouquets which they offered to all the ladies present exclamations of delight arose on every side exclamations which were for the most part high-pitched and noisy for the swagger set have long ceased to cultivate softness of voice or refinement of accent and once or twice the detestable slang word ripping escaped the lips of a few dashing dames reputed to be leaders of style repose of manner dignity and elegance of deportment however are no longer to be discovered among the present racing duchesses and gambling countesses of the bluest blue blood of england so one does not expect these graces of distinction from them the louder they can talk and the more slang they can adopt from the language of their grooms and stable boys the more they are judged to be in the swim and up to date 
I speak, of course, of the modern scions of aristocracy. There are a few truly great ladies left, whose maxim is still noblesse oblige, but they are quite in the minority, and by the younger generation are voted either old cats or bores. Many of the cultured mob that now swarmed over my grounds had come out of the sheerest vulgar curiosity to see what the man with five millions could do in the way of entertaining. Others were anxious to get news, if possible, of the chances of Phosphor winning the derby, concerning which I was discreetly silent. But the bulk of the crowd wandered aimlessly about, staring impertinently or enviously at each other, and scarcely looking at the natural loveliness of the gardens, or the woodland scenery around them. The brainlessness of modern society is never so flagrantly manifested as at a garden party, where the restless trousered and petticoated bipeds move vaguely to and fro, scarcely stopping to talk civilly or intelligently to one another for five minutes, most of them hovering dubiously and awkwardly between the refreshment pavilion and the bandstand. In my domain they were deprived of this latter harbour of refuge, for no musicians could be seen, though music was heard, beautiful, wild music, which came first from one part of the grounds and then from another, and to which few listened with any attention. All were, however, happily unanimous in their enthusiastic appreciation of the excellence of the food provided for them in the luxurious luncheon tents, of which there were twenty in number. Men ate as if they had never eaten in their lives before, and drank the choice and exquisite wines with equal greed and gusto. One never entirely realizes the extent to which human gourmandism can go till one knows a few peers, bishops, and cabinet ministers, and watches those dignitaries feed ad libitum. Soon the company was so complete that there was no longer any need for me to perform the fatiguing duty of receiving, and I therefore took Sybil in to luncheon, determining to devote myself to her for the rest of the day. She was in one of her brightest and most captivating moods. Her laughter rang out as sweetly joyous as that of some happy child. She was even kind to Diana Chesney, who was also one of my guests, and who was plainly enjoying herself with all the verve peculiar to pretty American women, who consider flirtation as much of a game as tennis. The scene was now one of great brilliancy, the light costumes of the women contrasting well with the scarlet and gold liveries of the seemingly innumerable servants that were now everywhere in active attendance. And, constantly, through the fluttering festive crowd, from tent to tent, from table to table and group to group, Lucio moved, his tall stately figure and handsome face always conspicuous wherever he stood, his rich voice thrilling the air whenever he spoke. His influence was irresistible, and gradually dominated the whole assemblage. He roused the dull, inspired the witty, encouraged the timid, and brought all the conflicting elements of rival position, character, and opinion into one uniform whole, which was unconsciously led by his will as easily as a multitude is led by a convincing orator. I did not know it then, but I know now, that metaphorically speaking, he had his foot on the neck of that society mob, as though it were one prostrate man, that the syncophants, liars, and hypocrites, whose utmost idea of good is wealth and luxurious living, bent to his secret power as reeds bend to the wind, and that he did with them all whatsoever he chose, as he does to this very day. God, if the grinning, guzzling, sensual fools had only known what horrors were about them at the feast, what ghastly ministers to pleasurable appetite waited obediently upon them, what pallid terrors lurked behind the gorgeous show of vanity and pride. But the veil was mercifully down, and only to me has it since been lifted. Luncheon over, the singing of mirthful voices, tuned to a kind of village roundelay, attracted the company, now fed to repletion, towards the lawn at the back of the house, and cries of delight were raised as the maypole came into view, I myself joining in the universal applause, for I had not expected to see anything half so picturesque and pretty. The pole was surrounded by a double ring of small children, children so beautiful in face and dainty in form, that they might very well have been taken for little fairies from some enchanted woodland. The boys were clad as tiny foresters, in doublets of green, with pink caps on their curly locks. The girls were in white, with their hair flowing loosely over their shoulders, and wreaths of may-blossoms crowning their brows. 
as soon as the guests appeared on the scene these exquisite little creatures commenced their dance each one taking a trail of blossom or a ribbon pendant from the maypole and weaving it with the others into no end of beautiful and fantastic designs i looked on as amazed and fascinated as any one present at the wonderful lightness and ease with which these children tripped and ran their tiny twinkling feet seemed scarcely to touch the turf their faces were so lovely their eyes so bright that it was a positive enchantment to watch them each figure they executed was more intricate and effective than the last and the plaudits of the spectators grew more and more enthusiastic till presently came the finale in which all the little green foresters climbed up the pole and clung there pelting the white-robed maidens below with cowslip balls knots of roses bunches of violets posies of buttercups daisies and clover which the girl children in their turn laughingly threw among the admiring guests the air grew thick with flowers and heavy with perfume and resounded with song and laughter and sibyl standing at my side clapped her hands in an ecstasy oh it is lovely lovely she cried is this the prince's idea then as i answered in the affirmative she added where i wonder did he find such exquisitely pretty little children as she spoke lucio himself advanced a step or two in front of the other spectators and made a slight peremptory sign the fairy-like foresters and maidens with extraordinary activity all sprang away from the maypole pulling down the garlands with them and winding the flowers and ribbons about themselves so that they looked as if they were all tied together in one inextricable knot this done they started off at a rapid run presenting the appearance of a rolling ball of blossom merry pipe music accompanying their footsteps till they had entirely disappeared among the trees oh do call them back again entreated sibyl laying her hand coaxingly on lucio's arm i should so like to speak to two or three of the prettiest he looked down at her with an enigmatical smile you would do them too much honour lady sibyl he replied they are not accustomed to such condescension from great ladies and would not appreciate it they are paid professionals and like many of their class only become insolent when praised at that moment diana chesney came running across the lawn breathless i can't see them anywhere she declared pantingly the dear little darlings i ran after them as fast as i could i wanted to kiss one of those perfectly scrumptious boys but they're gone not a trace of them left it's just as if they had sunk into the ground again lucio smiled they have their orders he said curtly and they know their place just then the sun was obscured by a passing black cloud and a peal of thunder rumbled overhead looks were turned to the sky but it was quite bright and placid save for that one floating shadow of storm only summer thunder said one of the guests there will be no rain and the crowd that had been pressed together to watch the maypole dance began to break up in groups and speculate as to what diversion might next be provided for them i watching my opportunity drew sibyl away come down by the river i whispered i must have you to myself for a few minutes she yielded to my suggestion and we walked away from the mob of our acquaintance and entered a grove of trees leading to the banks of that part of the avon which flowed through my grounds here we found ourselves quite alone and putting my arm round my betrothed i kissed her tenderly tell me i said with a half smile do you know how to love yet she looked up with a passionate darkness in her eyes that startled me yes i know was her unexpected answer you do and i stopped to gaze intently into her fair face and how did you learn she flushed red then grew pale and clung to me with a nervous almost feverish force very strangely she replied and quite suddenly the lesson was easy i found too easy geoffrey she paused and fixed her eyes full on mine i will tell you how i learnt it but not now some other day here she broke off and began to laugh rather forcedly i will tell you when we are married she glanced anxiously about her then with a sudden abandonment of her usual reserve and pride threw herself into my arms and kissed my lips with such ardour as made my senses reel sibyl sibyl i murmured holding her close to my heart oh my darling you love me at last you love me hush hush she said breathlessly 
You must forget that kiss. It was too bold of me. It was wrong. I did not mean it. I... I was thinking of something else. Geoffrey. And her small hand clenched on mine with a sort of eager fierceness. I wish I had never learned to love. I was happier before I knew. A frown knitted her brows. Now, she went on in the same breathless hurried way, I want love. I am starving, thirsty for it. I want to be drowned in it, lost in it, killed by it. Nothing else will content me. I folded her still closer in my arms. Did I not say you would change, Sybil? I whispered. Your coldness and insensibility to love was unnatural and could not last. My darling, I always knew that. You always knew? She echoed a little disdainfully. Ah, but you do not know even now what has chanced to me. Nor shall I tell you yet. Oh, Geoffrey! Here she drew herself out of my embrace, and stooping, gathered some bluebells in the grass. See these little flowers, growing so purely and peacefully in the shade by the Avon? They remind me of what I was, here, in this very place, long ago. I was quite as happy, and I think as innocent as these blossoms. I had no thought of evil in my nature, and the only love I dreamed of was the love of the fairy prince for the fairy princess as harmless an idea as the loves of the flowers themselves. Yes, I was then all I should like to be now, all that I am not. You are everything that is beautiful and sweet, I told her admiringly, as I watched the play of retrospective and tender expression on her perfect face. So you judge, being a man who is perfectly satisfied with his own choice of a wife, she said with a flash of her old cynicism but I know myself better than you know me. You call me beautiful and sweet, but you cannot call me good. I am not good. Why, the very love that now consumes me is... What? I asked her quickly, seizing her hands with the bluebells in them, and gazing searchingly into her eyes. I know before you speak that it is the passion and tenderness of a true woman. She was silent for a moment. Then she smiled with a bewitching languor. If you know, then I need not tell you, she said. So do not let us stay here any longer talking nonsense. Society will shake its head over us and accuse us of bad form. And some lady paragraphist will write to the papers and say, Mr. Tempest's conduct as a host left much to be desired, as he and his bride-elect were spooning all the day. There are no lady paragraphists here, I said laughing, and encircling her dainty waist with one arm as I walked. Oh, are there not, though? she exclaimed, laughing also. Why, you don't suppose you can give any sort of big entertainment without them, do you? They permeate society. Old Lady Maravale, for example, who is rather reduced in circumstances, writes a guinea's worth of scandal a week for one of the papers. And she is here. I saw her simply gorging herself with chicken salad and truffles an hour ago. Here, pausing and resting against my arm, she peered through the trees. There are the chimneys of Lily Cottage, where the famous Mavis Clare lives she said. Yes, I know, I replied readily. Rimenez and I have visited her. She is away just now, or she would have been here today. Do you like her? Sybil queried. Very much. She is charming. And the prince? Does he like her? Well, upon my word, I answered with a smile, I think he likes her more than he does most women. He showed the most extraordinary deference towards her, and seemed almost abashed in her presence. Are you cold, Sybil? I added hastily, for she shivered suddenly, and her face grew pale. You had better come away from the river. It is damp under these trees. Yes, let us go back to the gardens in the sunshine, she answered dreamily. So your eccentric friend, the woman-hater, finds something to admire in Mavis Clare. She must be a very happy creature, I think, perfectly free, famous, and believing in all good things of life and humanity, if one may judge from her books. Well, taken altogether, life isn't so very bad, I observed playfully. She made no reply, and we returned to the lawns where afternoon tea was now being served to the guests, who were seated in brilliant scattered groups under the trees or within the silken pavilions, while the sweetest music, and the strangest, if people had only had ears to hear it, both vocal and instrumental, was being performed by those invisible players and singers, whose secret whereabouts was unknown to all, save Lucio. End of chapter 23